Hello everyone, it's Friday and the weekend is about to start, and as ever I hope this gets it off to a great beginning for all of you. Three hospital themed stories tonight. Some were suggested as a doctor, <laughs> I should be doing hospital themed stories. And you know what, it never occurred to me before, but that's a great suggestion, so here we are. Um, a real mixed bunch for you tonight, covering the supernatural, alien abduction, um, all kinds of weird shit, basically. So, uh, sit back and relax with your favorite drinks, I guess. Because now it's time to listen. <laughs> ah. It was a stupid idea. I just wanted to see what was inside, and what it was all about. It was scheduled for demolition. It had been plenty of times before, but it had always got delayed or cancelled. I just wanted to know what was behind all the rumours. No one else wanted to come with me, so I had to go alone. Well. I really didn't want to go by myself, but what was the worst I was going to find? Hobos, crazed junkies, a feral dog. I figured I could handle anything, but I brought a knife anyway. The stories were just that. Stories. There's no such thing as ghosts or monsters. I decided to start out at midday, so I had plenty of time to explore the building while there was still daylight. Even so, I wasn't going to stay there during the night. There was something off about that hospital, and I had to know what. It was hard to get in, but I managed to find a broken window on the first floor on the west wing. The room inside was a huge mess. Things had been smashed and thrown around everywhere, and a bed was lying on its side. Sheets were strewn about, a small table had fallen, and various medical utensils were scattered across the room. A scalpel was embedded in the far wall. I concluded that it had probably been some stupid kids messing around, thinking they were cool for destroying things in an abandoned hospital. It was darker than I first imagined. I cursed my poor memory, wishing I'd remembered to bring a flashlight. Just in case, I decided to try one of the light switches by the door on the left. And much to my relief and surprise, they worked. I didn't spend much time wondering why. The door next to the switches was hanging half of its hinges. Pushing it out of the way, I headed into the corridor. It was even darker, with very little light at all. There was a strange smell, and it was slightly disturbing. I couldn't put my finger on what it was exactly. I felt my courage leaving me. This place was so creepy. No, I told myself. There's nothing scary here. If there is anything else, you can probably kill it. With that, I took in my surroundings. To my left, the north, there was an emergency exit, and to my right, the hallway continued into the building in complete darkness. I felt myself shudder as I looked down it. I asked myself if the emergency door still worked. Checking around in the dark, I couldn't find any switches nearby, and I did not want to leave the comforting light of the first room. I was just about to head back when the lights in the corridor flickered on. Scared me half to death. I decided that the lights in the other room were somehow connected to the hallway lights and there'd just been some kind of delay. I moved down the corridor and further into the hospital. I saw a few dark empty rooms on the way. There were a few creaks and 
some little noises. But I was certain that they were just the building expanding in the afternoon heat. What was strange was that the corridor just went on like this for an impossibly long distance. I was sure that it should have reached the end by now. I turned back to see how far I had come. Some six doors down was the room I'd entered and the same emergency exit beyond it. That's when I'd had enough. I went back to the room, but it wasn't the same room. There was blood smeared all over the wall, as if someone had painted it with their hands. The light seemed to have no source. I glanced around for the window. There were none. I couldn't understand. The room had been here just a minute ago. I stumbled out of the room and heard a door further along the corridor slam. I slowly turned and looked behind me. Nothing there. Panic gripped me and I ran from the blood-drenched room. Trying to find a way out of the hospital, I ran and ran and got nowhere for a very long time. After sprinting for what could have been minutes or hours, I stopped, leaned against a wall, took a breath, and managed to calm myself down. (laughs) There must be some sort of reasonable explanation for all this. Maybe you took a turn without realizing, I thought to myself. Suddenly, There were a series of loud groans and creaks behind me. To my right, there was a new corridor. I walked over and investigated it. No more than ten meters away was a spiral staircase. It occurred to me that spiral staircases aren't usually found in hospitals. But, with all the other weird crap going on, I wasn't going to question it. I went over to it to check how stable it was. I shook the handrail. Hmm, seemed sturdy enough. The whole thing seemed to be made of some sort of black metal. I looked back at the corridor. I knew if I went back there, I would be trapped forever. I didn't take a turn and forget about it. It was this place. The stairway was probably the most normal thing there. Nothing strange happened as I climbed up. It ended where I'd expected it to, and I walked off onto the second floor. It was another corridor, almost exactly like the last one, only it went west to east. Looking behind me, I saw that the stairs had disappeared. I need to get out. There has to be a way, I thought. I searched all the rooms in the hopes that I could find some way to get out. Some of them were ruined with objects thrown everywhere. Some of them were filled with blood and disturbing symbols. Some of them were just empty. Eventually I came across a room with only a chair inside. It was standing upright in the center of the room. It was odd, but I thought, not important. I continued my search for some sort of escape. As I was checking the next room, I heard something wooden scrape along the ground several meters away. I turned back and saw the chair, just sitting there, spooked. I hastened my inspection, putting distance between me and the chair. I'd just finished searching two more rooms when I heard it again. It was closer this time. I stared at it and slowly backed away. I blinked. I heard the noise again. Behind me this time, There wasn't even a meter between me 
and it. I blinked again. Now it was almost pressed against my legs. What, what? the fuck? Fuck. fuck? I screamed at the chair, at the hospital, at everything. The chair vanished. I was alone again in the never-ending corridor. Let me out of here! Out of here. The whole building was silent. I waited for a second. Nothing happened. I went back to searching the rooms. I had an awful feeling that I'd made a huge mistake. It took me a while. It must have been hours before I worked it out. Slowly, the lights were dimming. Hour by hour, they grew more dull. Soon, there would be no light. Only me and whatever controlled this place. Whatever liked to paint it with blood. Trapped forever in the hospital. One, two, three. One, two, three. There were three lights, every three feet in this hospital. He noted dully how they fluctuated as he was rushed in on one of those gurneys. He could feel the blood draining, oozing from his wrists, his elbows and sides. The leather straps holding him down were slick with blood. The doctors around him were yelling to one another, as though worried. His eyes were cold, and his breath was shallow. One blink, and he was in a hospital room. Everything was white. His arms were bandaged, and so were his sides. There was a slight sting, one that was dulled out by pain pills. Rage began to fill him. They'd taken away his red wings. He was an angel, and those damned humans had taken away his red wings. How dare they? He was the one they should be bowing to. He was the one that would save humanity. He was God's messenger. It then dawned on him, and he began to giggle. Laugh, even. Simple-minded humans did not understand the importance of his life. They were afraid of him, and they damn well should be. He sat up. Those dumb apes hadn't even strapped him down. They thought whatever kind of sedative they'd given him would be all they needed until morning. Maybe, but he wasn't human. Nothing would hold him down, or keep him obedient. He slid his legs over the edge of the bed and pushed himself up. His body was young and wounded, however, he was strong. Gingerly, he began to remove the bandages, dropping them silently on the floor. His skin was red, gruesome, and stitched. He stared at them and began to cackle yet again, louder this time. He picked at the stitches, pulling them free. Blood oozed from the reopened wounds, and for a moment, he paused and stared at the veins peeking from his wounds. They were now turning red, exposed to the air. He smiled and pressed his fingers into the wound, beneath the vein, and pulled up and freed them. There was a tear before the blood began to pour. Again, cackling as he began to leave his room. There was no one to stop him down either side of the hallway. Well, there were patients, however. 
He strode down the halls, wiping blood all over the white, sterile walls. He walked into the room of a young girl. She was dying, a cancer patient. However, she was on the road to recovery, at least according to the clipboard at her feet. He let out a tss as he walked up to her and gently touched her cheek. Child, he whispered, rubbing his blood-soaked thumb along her skin. God will take you, I promise. He turned to the saline drip IV that led to the crease of her arm. He pulled the tube from the bag and began to let his wrist drip into it. He then reinserted the tube. Suddenly, the little girl's eyes snapped open. Her mouth widened, and she stared up at him. She choked, and then writhed. Her hands clawed at the sheets, and her legs cramped. Then, her eyes were melting, her tongue boiling in her mouth. The stench of burnt flesh filled the air. He watched as her skin blackened and her teeth charred. And then it stopped. He turned and trotted down the hall. The next room, there was a man that had been in a car accident. He placed the blood into his IV and left without waiting for the man's reaction. And then another young boy maybe about the age of ten. He had been beaten to a pulp. However, as the angel neared, he shrank away. He shook as he stared up at the bleeding man. The angel turned his head and smiled. His skin receded from his teeth, which were filed. His eyes were silver, and his wrists and hands were smeared with blood. The boy's breath hitched. The man stood beside the boy's bed, his smile gone now. A thin line was all that he could see. A few minutes passed, and the boy began to calm. He took in a deep breath and relaxed, almost like they had just become friends. The angel leaned over the boy, who didn't withdraw. His silver eyes were hollow and ringed with blood. The boy, however, did not wince. And then, suddenly, the angel bit down on the boy's face. A sickening crunch of the boy's skull sounded, and the boy let out a scream. He cried and tried in vain to shove him off his body. However, his hands were restrained as the angel gnawed on his face. The skin was slowly torn from his head, and his eyes were pulled from their sockets. He sobbed as the flesh was torn from his mouth. The angel jerked back, swallowing the boy's flesh in one gulp. As he pulled back from his work, he examined it. Flesh hung off the boy's jaw and he was still alive, crying. His voice was feeble as he cried. The angel released his wrists. The boy hyperventilated from his lack of a face, and he turned to the side, his hair falling onto his sticky red skull. And then, he was gone. Happily, the angel skipped down the hall. He smeared blood all over the walls as he did. In his wake, he left crying and screaming men and women. His veins were all over the floor as he cackled. But suddenly, he felt weak, light-headed and dull. He stumbled to a halt beside a door. No. God was restricting him. But why? Why was God holding him back so he couldn't deliver the souls unto him? 
he slid down the wall, smearing blood on his back. His veins bubbled and burned. There was a tearing in his shoulder, and he let out a number of deafening screams. God was tearing away his wings. The pain was too much, and the angel thrashed. A wet thud sounded, and the angel turned his head. He could see, outlined in red, his left wing. It then disappeared into dust. The angel was now human. His mutilated veins drained of his life. He began to laugh, to cackle. His vision was leaving him. However, so was the pain. His grin split his lips and tore up his throat. <laughs> Laughing. God had made him human. However, he was still an angel. He laughed to himself, screaming into the night of his angel heritage, of his relation to his brothers Gabriel and Michael. Newspaper Report. New York. August 24th. In the Western Ania Hospital, six bodies were found. Police say that the bodies were all burnt from the inside. All the victims except one had red liquid inside their IV drips. However, there were no clear signs of the cause. Two of the bodies were of children. One was a boy with his face ripped from his skull. Police say he died after the fact. The sixth body was that of a young boy, whose identity is still to be determined. Upon closer inspection, it seemed he was the cause of the red liquid, as his veins were ripped open. Beside the place he lay, there was a detailed outline of what looked to be an angel's wing, with dust in the middle. On the wall beside the boy, written in the boy's blood, was a message. All hail God, the mighty Savior. Those who inquire of my occupation are usually more mortified than intrigued when I tell them what it consists of. I do understand their disgust, however. Working around dead bodies tends to make many very uncomfortable. Those who become interested in the business usually leave within a few months. The sight of sliced limbs and contorted bodies can frighten away almost anyone. But for me, this choice of profession provided an opportunity of a lifetime. I know of many who utilize the craft as a cover for their many malicious intents. Necrophilia, murder, cannibalism, and many others are just some of the activities this particular job aids in. I myself have often dabbled in some of the more taboo leisures, but, just like so many others, I have finally found my niche. You see, my particular hobby aims to benefit society and mankind alike. The constant flow of corpses makes it virtually impossible for my accomplishments to dwindle in my charity for this less than deserving world. I should have abandoned this position long ago and let the world perish. <laughs> my word, I feel like I'm rambling. I suppose I should further explain what my specific hobby actually is. You see, there are beings watching over us at this very moment, waiting for their chance to rid the earth of its imperfections. I have, on multiple occasions, encountered these beings at a nearby Starbucks, of course, garbed with human-like semblance. They ordered caramel frappes, 
stating that it's a delicacy on their planet. How they are able to produce such a thing as caramel, I will never know. Anyway, they have confided in me their need of a larger planet, stating that theirs can no longer produce enough energy to sustain their existence. The human body itself can produce a power source large enough to power a steamroller, and they estimated needing 10,000 bodies a year to live sustainably. I guess suggesting guinea pigs on wheels was <laughs> out of the question. Considering that more than 100 people die every minute, we could more than supply our fair share of assistance without the total annihilation of the human race. So, against my better judgments, I struck up a deal that I'd supply the bodies they needed to sustain their planet, as long as they kept their distance from Earth. Now, I'm not one to show my affections for such an atrocious planet as this, but my existence on this giant blue and green ball has yet to come to its conclusion. If I was sacrificial, you'd all be doomed, as human extinction wouldn't weigh too heavily upon my conscience if I were to cause it. Animal extinction, on the other hand, would be a tragedy. <laughs> oh my, seems like I am rambling again. Where was I? I suppose a status update of my progression would suffice. For a while, I was able to keep up with a steady number of desired corpses, constantly convincing loved ones of the deceased to opt for cremations or closed caskets. Curious minds often threatened to end my charitable donations to our alien overlords, but a large enough payoff usually kept them quiet. After a while, their need for human cadavers increased as they began the industrialization of their society, claiming it to be inspired by our civilization. It became increasingly difficult to keep up my end of the deal, forcing me to resort to drastic measures. Do you know how incredibly embarrassing it is to defile freshly closed graves? <sighs> I felt like a grave robber without a sense of morality left in my body. It's incredibly demeaning. I quickly discovered that, even after working nearly an entire night, I could only recover about five bodies a day. Eight if I cut out lunch breaks. Oh, that delicious pastrami on rye would just have to wait until I'd returned home. Having to pay others to do the job for me was even more humiliating. I felt like a pimp for a chain of ghost bride operations. Now, I suppose I sound a bit condescending but I'm sure you'd feel the same if the world's safety were in your hands. I've even had to resort to stealing bodies from other local funeral homes or paying off those in different cities to deliver them to me. As the progression of their society expanded, my workload doubled, and soon the demand swelled beyond that of the supply. I was able to convince many to take part in my daily <laughs> donations, but again found it difficult to keep up my end of the bargain. Fortunately for me, there are those desperate enough to do almost anything for a payoff, and I am more than willing to offer up the dough. Murder, from many viewpoints, can be viewed as either a positive or a negative, depending on its context. If someone murders a paedophile or a rapist, who is really the criminal? Does anyone really bat an eye if the guy in an action film dies unexpectedly? Sometimes, to do what is right, the uh, wrong path must be followed. And in order to protect the world, sacrifices must be made. 
There are more than enough troubled minds out there willing to take an innocent life. Many participating just for a cheap thrill. I myself am not opposed to the sacrifice of the few to save the many. And I'm not against taking part in the bloodshed. The sliver of guilt you feel when taking someone's life is damaging at the very least. But you quickly learn to get over it. Their horrid screams become muffled by your desire to survive and your thirst for a continued existence. There are at least 150 serial killers at work at any given time. And it's safe to say 50% of that population works for me. We have, so far, being able to keep up with the demand from those insufferable beings in command. But as the amount continues to grow, we get more and more desperate. The private residences of common citizens becomes a breeding ground for uh, potential donations. <laughs> Controlled arsons and carefully placed clues allows us to keep just beyond the detection of the authorities, and keep us from getting caught. Despite what you may think of me, dear listener, I'm sure, deep down, you approve of my actions. After all, this largely benefits you as well. It's true that I began this deal under selfish intents, but I believe if anyone's life was in jeopardy, they'd go down the same road I did. I never really planned on conveying this information to anyone, let alone a total stranger. But, as I've stated before, I'm extremely desperate. As of now, we're in dire need of volunteers for sacrifices. We know this is a lot to ask. But our local wells are starting to dry up. And we refuse to kill any children. We do have morals, you know. If we cannot maintain our end of the bargain, then I don't know how much longer we'll all have to live. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>